Welcome to the latest edition of the Sense Making series. So probably like everyone since last Wednesday, I've been kind of doom scrolling on Twitter, reading, listening, trying to work out what has been going on. So the extraordinary events in the Capitol on Wednesday, then the backlash of the tech companies afterwards, the free speech implications. So in this film, I try to make sense of it all and also link to some of the best stories, podcasts that I found. Uh, the details are in the show notes below. So in this film, I look at topics like the full emergence of QAnon into the center of the kind of national story and the basically what it means in terms of the rise of the irrational. The eruption of the irrational into the rational, which symbolized by the QAnon shaman in the Senate, like that as a, as a, as a symbol of what I think we've been talking about on the channel for an awfully long time, like we're in religious times, we're in the times where the irrational is coming back into the secular world, whether we want it or not. And, and that, the, the QAnon shaman is the perfect example. He's, he's the conspirituality we've talked about on the podcast. He's, he's a psychedelic visionary who, has, who is now following QAnon. And also the belief system of QAnon and how it overlaps with deep religious mythology. What I find fascinating about it is how Christian the whole thing is. It's like the Day of Judgment. And imagine a Christian millennial cult where the Day of Judgment is coming up now, like in the next, in the next few days. Like that's basically what we're dealing with at the moment. And that's the intensity of the moment. And also the social media crackdown, most obviously the removal of Donald Trump from Twitter, and then how Parler, the alternative social media app, was basically taken down. The Parler case is interesting in, in a different way because Parler shows that it, it's not, even if you can set up an alternative to Twitter and to Facebook as Parler did, you're vulnerable at the hardware level. You're vulnerable at a much deeper level that you can be shut down by effectively a cartel of Silicon Valley companies. And that is a, that's a terrifying situation. And also trying to dig into the genuine dilemmas of free speech online. If you're a free speech absolutist and you say, I think uh, armed, like an increase in, in armed groups, I think an increase in, uh, in, in deaths, an increase in conflict is a price worth paying for everyone to have unlimited access to all social media channels at all times. Fair play, you've got a stronger stomach than I do. You might be right, you might be wrong, I don't know. But I, I, I don't see that there's any alternative to some kind of moderation, because I, I just don't think it works in the small scale, and I don't think it can work in the large scale. So this was a Q&A talk for the Rebel Wisdom community that I'm putting up on the channel. So I hope you enjoy it. What I've been really increasingly shocked by now is this sort of sense of epistemic fracture, this sense like the narratives are just sort of veering off in different directions. In particular, that holding one perspective is seeming to mean that someone can't hold the other perspective as well. That, I, especially on social media, I'm seeing people kind of basically either denying the evidence of their own eyes or minimizing or what abouting. Increasingly, like over the last three months, just it's so difficult to say anything about the current situation without providing more context. But like there's always a layer of context that you seem to need and then you have to go back another layer and another layer and another layer of like, well, I'm not saying this and I am saying this and of course I'm not minimizing. So you see, for example, this going on, I'm sure we've all seen it on social media, like talking about the events on the Capitol, you immediately on one side say, well, what about the, the Black Lives Matter riots in the summer? The, the media played that down. All of these things have a layer of truth like there are layers of truth in all of these narratives, but they're often used to obscure or to deny or to ignore the truth in the other narratives. And that's what I've really been seeing over the last five days is this sense of, as we've talked about on the channel, this kind of epistemic fracture just feels like an existential problem at the moment. Um, and especially just the, the, the need, and I see, I see people that, that I have always valued, I've always rated their kind of ability to see things clearly increasingly spinning out. And I'm seeing that on, I see it especially on Facebook. I feel like there's something about the, the way that Facebook is built and probably the nature of groups on Facebook where most of us are spending our time, that it's become an increasingly toxified and 
radicalizing place. Like I think these groups have become quite radicalizing. I spend I spend a lot more time on Twitter and I follow people from all over the political map on Twitter and I'm constantly kind of calibrating what someone is saying um, and then looking at people who, looking at who's surprising me by what, what I wouldn't necessarily expect that they were saying. I, I, I'd like to sort of frame it like that, that everything I'm saying is provisional in, in some sense, but it's also informed by, I've been a journalist for about 20 years. I've covered American politics a lot. I was based in Washington for a little while while I was at Channel 4 News. Um, I, I covered the 2008 election in America, spent quite a lot of time there and obviously um, have been, yeah, kind of fairly obsessively following it for a long time. I'm also aware that I'm not American, so I hope Americans don't get offended if I am, uh, if I say things that are out of, uh, that they don't agree with. And I think that I know nothing about their country, which I maybe don't. Um, and so the, the format of this is going to be, I've, I've got a few notes here that I'm going to go through fairly uh, systematically. I'm going to talk a little bit, there's, there's stuff that I haven't really put out on the channel before about QAnon, for example, which I actually regret now that I didn't do a little bit more on it because I, everything that happened on, on Wednesday was not surprising. It, it was that was going to happen. Like the nature of QAnon, the nature of that religious mindset. So I recorded a couple of pieces to do today that hopefully will go out on the channel tomorrow with Eric Davis and with Gary Lackman and with Jules Evans, all talking about like the, the, the religious nature of the times that we're in and the, the eruption of the irrational into the rational, which symbolized by the QAnon shaman in the Senate, like that as a, as, a, as a symbol of what I think we've been talking about on the channel for an awfully long time, like we're in religious times, we're in the times where the irrational is coming back into the secular world, whether we want it or not. And, and that, the, the QAnon shaman is the perfect example. He's, he's the conspirituality we've talked about on the podcast. He's, he's a psychedelic visionary who has, who is now following QAnon. Like he's an incredible example of a lot of the things we've been talking about on the channel. Um, so so that's, that's what I'm putting out on the channel. I don't know if I'm gonna put this out on the channel. I'll see how it goes and how I feel about it after, I've, after we've gone through it. Um, but, but that's what I feel like, that's what I feel rebel wisdom is for, is like those are, those are frames that we don't see anywhere else. But I'm also interested, like I feel like part of rebel wisdom and I think part of what I hear from the community that, that people want is, is, is sense making. And I think this is, this is my attempt to sort of share some of my sense making in terms of like the more nitty gritty, the more sort of nuts and bolts of it. Um, and also to understand that none of us, none of us come to anything without some priors. Like we all have, you can't make sense of the world at all without priors. We, because then there's just a, a mass of information, like there's always going to be some bias in things that we do. All we can do is try and um, m approximate or at least hold our strong opinions as lightly as possible, maybe hold them with a sort of sense of um, a percentage rather than a certainty. And that's really, I think, what we've been, what we've been talking about a lot as well. Um, so what I'm also going to do is I've, I've got some links. I've got a couple of video clips and some links of some of the best news articles that I found over the last few days. And I will, I probably won't put them in the chat while we're, while we're doing this, but I'll certainly send out a, a, um, an email afterwards and maybe put something into circle with this recording for anyone who missed it. Um, and also this is a kind of evolution. This is, a, this is an experiment. We'll have a Q&A for the last half an hour or so. I've already put into the chat the uh, document so you can go to the document if there's anything that comes up, you want to put some questions in rather than put it into the chat, because uh, that can get a little bit messy. You can go to the document and Clay, if you could do me a favor and find the, go, go up the chat and find that document and then just repost it every now and again, just so that people have it handy. That'd be really helpful. Thank you. And I, and I think I'm gonna frame this around the topic of free speech. I was thinking about this today and Trump being kicked off Twitter and Parler being taken down, kind of 
bookends it and also brings it sort of firmly into what I kind of consider my territory in terms of journalism and uh, information. And it's, it's, a, it's a deeply significant moment, the President of the United States being taken off his main platform, Parler being taken down. Um, and I, I'm very, very conscious of the, the concerns with that. Like uh, I spoke to Daniel Schmachtenberger uh, yesterday and kind of reflecting on the parlor situation, like parlor situation is really quite astonishing in a way and quite terrifying of what it signifies because it's not only like Twitter, you can argue like Trump has broken Twitter's terms of service many times in the past. He got, an ex he got a, a way out. Twitter has different rules for heads of state than they have for private citizens. So that's one of the reasons he was he was able to stay on. Um, they've obviously broken that now. A lot of people have pointed out that the hypocrisy because um, the head of Iran is still on, the head of China is still on, the Chinese Communist Party is still on, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, there's no consistency in these, in the way that these rules are being enforced. But, uh, and, but the Parler case is interesting in, in a different way because Parler shows that it, it's not even if you can set up an alternative to Twitter and to Facebook, as Parler did, you're vulnerable at the hardware level. You're vulnerable at a much deeper level that you can be shut down by effectively a cartel of Silicon Valley companies. And that is a, that's a terrifying situation. There's a, there's a great quote that someone put up that if you can silence the king, you are the king, which I think is a really interesting quote. So I, I'm, I'm well aware and I'm completely, I'm seeing a lot of, like I'm very persuaded by these arguments, like the unaccountability of the tech platforms, we've done a lot of stuff on. But I also hope, what I want to do by the end of this is to, is to try and communicate why I think it's not as simple as that. I don't think it's a simple, I don't think there's any simplicity in this at all. I don't think it's, I, I, I would hate to have to make that decision. I don't actually know what I think about Trump being banned. I don't, I can't say for sure I think it's a bad thing. I can't say for sure that taking the, they've taken about 70,000 QAnon uh, accounts off, off Twitter. I can't say for sure that I know that that's a bad thing either. And I'll try and explain why I think that is. And by the end, I hope that by the end, you'll at least understand why I think that if not, uh, if not agree. And also I think it's worth bringing in the frame that Jordan Hall talks about a lot, like that what we're dealing with here is a fourth, fourth generation war. He, he talked about that in the first situational assessment where he said, this is more akin to a revolutionary war than it is to politics. And in a revolution, a lot of people are focused on the violence. And I think the right to be focused on the violence, that's a terrifying thing. And a lot of what happened on Wednesday is terrifying. And a lot of serious people were involved with that, which I'll come to in a second. But we, we also need to look at what the other fronts in that war are, like the communications one is a front, uh, the, the networking is a front, the violence is another front, the authorities is another front, the elections, like they're all different fronts of a, of a war. And the interesting thing is that the tech platforms, they never started with, I mean, they, they, have, they certainly do lean in one, in one political direction, as I think many people know, but they started with a very libertarian ethos. We're platforms, we're not publishers. One of the interesting things that's happened now is they pretty much tacitly admitted that they are publishers. But that's actually kind of changed the game. And I think it might, there might be more consequences of that further forward. Because for a long time, people in journalism especially were saying, you are publishers, you're, you're dealing incredibly badly with topics that journalism has de dealt with and has been training to deal with or um, learning to deal with for hundreds of years. And these, these massive platforms that have eaten journalism are now dealing with it in incredibly clumsy ways, very hit and miss on the fly when they are the biggest platforms, when they've suddenly become the biggest platforms, the biggest kind of bottlenecks for information. And that's a really, it's a really difficult, and I do hear some journalists, I hear, I, I heard Douglas Murray recently talking about how bad and how uh, adolescent they were and how these were very simple questions. I don't agree with them. I think they are hugely difficult. I think they are big dilemmas. Um, and as I said, I, I don't necessarily know what the answer is. So I'm going to start by, by recapping Wednesday um, for those, just sort of recapping what probably everyone here knows. Um, 
I've heard a lot of people call it an insurrection. I think that for me feels like the right, the right term. What we know about what happened on that day was that Trump spoke to all of the all of the the crowd and tacitly encouraged them to march on the Capitol. He was, we don't yet know why the police response was like it was. That's a real un unknown that I think is going to come out soon, but it's it's very concerning as to why that happened. Trump did not bring in the National Guard. The National Guard was eventually brought in by Pence uh, some hours afterwards. There's talk that Trump and uh, Trump and his family were watching it all on TV. They were very excited by what they saw. The, along with kind of a lot of the QAnon followers and the sort of the um, general Trumpists, you also had some pretty, some pretty dark stuff. You had, I don't know if you've seen the picture of the guy with the Camp Auschwitz shirt. You had another one wearing a shirt which said 6MWE, which stands for 6 million Jews wasn't enough. So you've got all of these kind of some pretty dark stuff combined with a lot of kind of mom and pop. You've also maybe seen the pictures of um, sort of the basically a grandma in the Capitol kind of standing there with the American flag. I mean, it was all sorts of different people from all over the, the, the kind of the map. But also initially, I think the sense that everyone had was that it was it was almost comedy. You had the QAnon shame and you had this sort of sense of. This, this is the barbarians have taken over the capital, but there was a sort of humor to it. It, it. it seemed ludicrous. It seemed kind of almost humorous if you were able to kind of get over the, the bizarre scenes of kind of the barbarians invading the capital. And I think afterwards it became like a couple of, maybe a day later or afterwards, I think it became increasingly clear that there were pretty serious people among them. There was the, guy, there were the guys with the cable ties. There were the guys with the, the tasers. There were guys with grappling ropes. There were the guys with body armor, like it's it, and there were and one of the arrests has been of a former lieutenant colonel, and there were a lot of kind of military insignia. There were a lot of ex-military there. It seems pretty clear that there were people with serious plans to take hostages, who knows what, that were involved in that as well. And now I think I think that that's sort of been dawning ever since, and that's part of what I've been seeing with um the the kind of information warfare of still on on the right especially people saying no it was antifa they were they were antifa undercover or antifa started the violence has just been like it's which is ludicrous if you just watch any of the footage like the idea that the violence was started by antifa or that it wasn't like you, you can see the evidence of your own eyes that that's not the case and i think that's a kind of sense of it's fascinating to see like the cognitive dissonance of that kind of unfolding and then the defense of that cognitive dissonance. Um, and I was a little bit, I had a little bit of a um, testy interaction with Jordan Hall actually on, on Facebook because I saw him posting in the aftermath, we don't know what happened, beware of doubling down in your biases. Um, I mean, with stuff that I would normally agree with him on, like be careful not to jump to conclusions. We all have priors. Careful not to be certain that you know what you saw. And I would normally agree with him. But what I saw people doing with that was people on the right using that as a way of I'd see them kind of agreeing with Jordan and Jordan agreeing with them. And then they would go away and they'd be talking about crisis actors and how the QAnon shaman was really uh, he was an anti fur and did, and so, so people were using that kind of weaponized uncertainty as a way of avoiding the cognitive dissonance of realizing that along with, like I think, as I'm sure you will know from watching the, the content, I think there are huge blind spots on the left. I think that the insurgency, the, the, the insurgency against that, which included Trump, there was a lot of truth there of leftist overreach and there's a lot that that left out of the, the picture of the world, but also there was an awful lot of um, like the, the whole origin from 4chan onwards, like there was a lot of really reprehensible stuff on that side as well. And kind of the paradox, the irony is that for a long time, those here familiar with Jordan Peterson will know that we've talked about how on the left, the problem with the left is they're not good at drawing boundaries. They're not good at drawing boundaries around saying, okay, now the left has gone too far. We're going to kind of 
disassociate ourselves from the communists, we're going to disassociate ourselves from the, the rioters or whatever, and they're not very good at doing that. I'm seeing that happening in spades on the right. I'm not seeing, and I think the, the key thing for all of us now in terms of courage is to call out the people on our own side, whether that, whether that leads to, to losing prestige, whether that leads to losing friends, that's the only, the only mark of courage I think that we have. And it's something that um, is difficult to do. It's really difficult to do. I think you go through a certain kind of no man's land once you, I certainly felt that when I really sort of started uh, expressing that on Facebook and um, kind of being linked to the, the, the supposed fascist Jordan Peterson and all the rest of it. And um, it's, yeah, it's, I, that, that, that's the thing I would say. It's like, I'm not seeing that so much on the right. I'm not seeing the distancing. I'm not seeing the, um, the calling out of their own side, partly because everyone feels like it's so intense right now that the other side, the, the world is over if the other side gets into power, if we give any ground whatsoever, like everything is, has got to this point where people feel that they can't express, um, yeah, that, that, that they would be betraying their own side by, and I also think that's kind of motivated reasoning. People, people seem to intuit what the end point of a certain, of a certain argument is before they get there. I've noticed this, they kind of realize, I, if, I, if I started going there, I'd have to question this, 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 and this. So I'm not gonna take that first step. It's really fascinating how the mind works. Like you can kind of realize that, it, like we know it and we don't know it at the same time. We know where it leads. So we know we've actually worked, some part of us has already worked out that kind of ser series of, of realizations. Oh, I might have to say something, I might have to call someone out, or I might have to, and then we kind of basically defend ourselves against it. Um, and that's a fascinating situation. We'll come to the QAnon situation at the moment because that's that's the perfect example of what happens um the cognitive dissonance and the and, and what happens like we're all prey to cultish thinking i think what we're realizing as well is that like i'm fascinated by cults and then the nature of them but i think we're all in like almost everyone's in a cult of one type or another by by like whatever the particular worldview whether it's a mainstream cult or whether it's a um, like who is, I think very few people are really persuade, really prepared to follow through. So I'm going to play a quick clip now from Unheard and Andrew Sullivan. Andrew Sullivan, who I don't know if um, everyone here is familiar with. He, he's been on the Sam Harris podcast a lot. He's a British conservative who you could probably say he's an anti-Trumper. He's been, um, he, he's one of the first, first bloggers. He had a, something called The Daily Dish. He, I really admire him. He's, he's always been not afraid to say what he thinks. In his Daily Dish, he'll sort of put out kind of what he thinks. And then in the next, in the next episode, he'll say, he'll put out the, the best objections to whatever he put out in the last one, like objection of the day, which I think is really, really valuable. And I want to play this because I think he he nails the the dynamic that I think has been self reinforcing on both sides, and says that like he's obviously a conservative. He's worried about what it means for conservatives in the future with the with the potential overreach of the tech platforms. But I think he, for me, names where the lots of that responsibility lies. We've seen this extraordinary concerted purge by the technology companies. That seems quite frightening to me that, you know, a, an incoming administration married to an incredibly powerful tech platform. I mean, is that the new thing we're gonna need to be fighting against for the next few years? Yes, and it will be empowered by the fact that a, a genuine and principled and moderate defense of conservatism has forever in this country now been tainted with the forces of anarchy, sedition, and racism. I mean, that's the truth. They win. This is, this is, this was, this was the, if, if one wants to resist uh, uh, wokery, as it were, um, then we're already up against it now. I mean, and, and Trump is partly, no, a, a lot responsible 
And that's why I was always, those who were backing Trump to stop wokeness have no idea that maybe in due course, there will be a fight back. But we're under assault now from, from a, 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 an assailant left that, God help me, Trump has empowered, legitimized, and validated. I, I really value Andrew as a, as a, as a thinker who follows the, the, the thread of his thoughts. And I think that's true. For me, that was always true with like tr Trumpism empowering, like ratcheting up on both sides. Yeah, I, I'd always been very skeptical of the argument that Trump would fight back against the woke left or that things were getting to the point where that needed to happen. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about QAnon now, because I think it really illustrates the, the difficulty of where the tech platforms are. So I'm going, to play, I'm going to play another short video. QAnon Watchers group on Facebook, where a lot of family members who've lost friends to QAnon uh, are posting. And this has been doing the rounds on... I'll, I'll talk, I'll just men mention a little bit, I'm sure, I, I guess everyone here knows what QAnon is to some degree, but I'll just quickly recap. Um, QAnon is a, an all-encompassing conspiracy theory. Like I've been trying to be quite careful in talking on the channel about, obviously there are some conspiracies, there are people with different agendas, but for me it, it becomes, we need a new name for this, I think, like an all-encompassing conspiracy theory that explains everything becomes a kind of religious mindset, becomes something new. Um, and that for me is like QAnon is a perfect example. It answers, it supposedly answers everything. Trust the plan. Like it's, it's perfectly designed for, um, for giving you a sense of meaning, giving you a sense of understanding what's going on. And that sense of meaning is pretty dark that the world is controlled by a cabal of pedophiles and Satanists and cannibals who are soon to be exposed by Trump working together with some good people in the deep state, but the rest of the people in the deep deep state are, um, yeah, I mean, what I find terrifying about it is it's prepared people for, if Trump was to try something much darker, some kind of military coup in the next seven days. And I think the possibility that there are people within the law within law enforcement who would go along with that is very, very high. We don't know what happened to the law enforcement on the day at the Capitol. I've got a friend whose his son is a police officer in Sacramento. So hardly a kind of Trumpist hotbed. And he's the only non-Trump supporting uh, police officer there. Like I think, and Trump has said before, I, I've got the military and I've got the police. I mean, I hope that's not the case. But just if there was anything that happened, the, the fact that they estimate that between 15 to 20 percent of people are, are at least sympathetic to QAnon, like the effectiveness of a kind of PSYOP, whatever it is, to have infiltrated to that degree where 20 percent of people would welcome Trump taking over with, with an armed group is... That, that for me is astonishing. It's, 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 a, it's an incredible piece of work. Um, and so this piece, this video I'm gonna show now, it's doing, it was doing the rounds on Parler. And it's a, very, it's a very professionally produced piece that makes sense in context. So I'm gonna share it and then, then I'll, I'll pick up off the back of it. So at this point, I played this three minute film that I'm pretty sure the algorithms are looking out for. It's been taken down from, from Facebook, it's been taken down from most social media. So what it consisted of was a very kind of flashy Hollywood-esque compilation of Trump speaking, uh, Trump supporters, and the tone of it, so it was a, a lot of Trump speeches mashed together to create uh, one narrative that was effectively, the deep state's time is over, the hour of action has arrived, January 20th will be the day where the people take control of the country again. January 20th being Inauguration Day, of course. Ends with the Lord's Prayer and then the QAnon slogan, where we go one, we go all. Effectively adding up to this sort of climactic, bombastic message that January the 20th is this moment of truth. That was shared a lot on, every time it was shared, it's been taken down. So that, uh, I was sent it, or someone on the QAnon group basically said that 
they would what were what they were concerned about was they'd seen that film shared like three or four times in one of their neighborhood groups like they'd gone on to see where they could get firewood from and it was shared two or three times and was taken down almost immediately there's another um there's another poster that's being taken down and not shared that calls for an armed march on all of the capitals on the 17th uh, that maybe people have seen as well. For me, this, like, this, is the, this is the difficulty. Like there's nothing in that film that is incitement. There's nothing in that film that, um, that you could, that any terms of service of any, um, any social media company would be able to say, that is beyond the pale. There's nothing there, it's all contextual. It's all contextual. It's all basically saying it's your duty as an American. And, but, but we've got to the point where that narrative has been stoked where, that everyone knows what that means. The same, the same happened before the, the, the events on Wednesday. Trump didn't have to say, I need you to do this, 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 and this, that would then have met the legal kind of um, incitement it would have met the legal requirements for incitement. He didn't need to. And so we've, we've got to the point where it's, it's incredibly difficult to, to know what to do. Like if you're the tech platforms, I think they are, they're panicking right now because they, if, if something does happen in the run up to, to January 20th, and I think, like, I think some kind of violence is probably likely, I think it's unlikely to succeed. I was a little bit panicked and worried for a while. And then I heard a few, had a few more conversations, talked to a few more people and put my minds at rest. Um, but I think they're panicking right now to not be accused of basically being the platform where that, that, that led to violence, led to deaths or anything in the run up to, to January 20th. So there's an amazing, I'll, I'll send out a link to, for a bit more on QAnon. There's an amazing article at Bellingcat that I've got about the crowdsourced conspiracy. What I find fascinating about it is how Christian the whole thing is. It's like the day of judgment. And imagine a Christian millennial cult where the day of judgment is coming up now, like in the next, in the next few days. Like that's basically what we're dealing with at the moment. And that's the intensity of the moment that I think I mean, the positive thing about the, the QAnon cult in one way is that part of it is trust the plan. Trump's got this. On the 20th, you'll realize the, the storm will be upon us. We're about to have a mass blackout of communications. And then, I mean, all this stuff is going around at the moment. And when the communications come back, all of the, all of the deep state criminals will be in jail and Trump will have won and he'll have shown the election was fraudulent. And so in a way, it's a, it's a kind of... Um, it's a call to arms on one way, but it's also very, um, what's the word, apathetic in some ways as well, because it sort of says that everything's in hand. Don't worry about it, which is one of the reasons that Alex Jones and the sort of the more conspiratorial, uh, the, the more sort of info wars types hate it so much because they believe that you need to overthrow the globalists. Like you actually need to do something to over, but they believe in the sort of a lot of the same parts of the, of the, um, of the narrative, but they believe that you have to attack and defeat the globalists. Um, Alex Jones's removal from YouTube is another one. Free speech absolutism just breaks down when you come to conspiracy theories like that. Um, for a long time, YouTube was actively recommending Q, uh, um, Infowars content because the algorithm recognized it was the stickiest content around. You could if you kept feeding people conspiracies, because it taps in at such a visceral level, it's incredibly sticky content. People would watch it and they'd keep watching it and then they'd watch more of it. And it, the algorithms, so YouTube is responsible for radicalizing a huge number of people. And also it gives a sense that like the QAnon thing is like, if you're looking for meaning, it's a, it's a brilliant meaning. You, you're in the elite, you're in the, the, the know, you're, you're seeing what's really going down. No one else does. It's it's a very it's a very primal feeling. I, I, I like Jordan Hall's framing of it as a nascent collective intelligence. Uh, he did, he wrote a really interesting article about it. Say so it it looks crazy right now, but it's a new form of making sense of the world. I was like, yeah, okay, that kind of makes sense. But I I have to say I'm much more skeptical than I was. Having having spent a bit of time looking into it, there's an amazing podcast that I'll also send the link called uh, by. 
reply all. It looks at some of the people who were there at the beginning of where uh, QAnon started on the on the 8chan board. And it's astonishing how amateurish the whole thing is when you look at kind of who originally did those drops. Um, the idea that that would be a place that, that, that you get kind of a top secret Q clearance person going. The, the strong evidence is that it was or the, the main person who was doing those drops was the owner of the board, Jim Watkins. Like absolutely ridiculous things like uh, they were someone cracked the password and the password was Matlock. And then then eventually they got back in and then the guy, the whoever Q was either opened up a new account or got his account back and created a new password. And then someone cracked it again because he'd made it Matlock with an O instead of with a zero instead of an O. It's like, that is not what a, a Q clearance, um, that is not how the secu how security services kind of operate. Um, and there's, there's all sorts of stuff that just, the other, the other thing is that it was, a, it was a regular feature of 4chan and 8chan and many of these boards that people would LARP, people would live action role play and pretend to be things that they're not. And so there's a, I've, I've read a couple of books by um, people who, who kind of know that, have kind of looked at that culture really well. Like that was, a, that was a thing. Like you try and kind of take on different personas and most of the people on 4chan or 8chan at the beginning kind of knew that it was that it was probably a LARP, but when it escaped that, in the same way that when meme culture and when this kind of LARPing culture escaped from those message boards, people started taking it seriously. And it's it's trolling, it's effectively trolling that then becomes self-perpetuating or self-reinforcing. Uh, um, and the actual reality of what it is, whether it's a PSYOP, uh, who's involved, and I mean, now the idea, it, it's certainly, no matter how it started, it's certainly been taken over many times and different actors around the world have certainly been involved. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's such a powerful narrative that, um, and another great book to, that I highly recommend is This Is Not Propaganda by Peter Pomerantsev. And he looks at basically disinformation campaigns around the world and looks at kind of, it, it's not just a left-wing myth that Russia is really active doing disinformation campaigns like that that has happened and that's that's basically it's fourth generation warfare because there's no of course they are in the same way that America is in the same way that China is in the same way that everyone is because there's no there's no consequences for it like you can do that Russia even did a massive cyber attack against the, the US recently and there's no real consequences so of course that's going on I spent quite a bit of time looking into different conspiracy theories when I was at Channel 4 News, and I was going to a lot of kind of different workshops. I'd take I was a journalist. I'd be hanging out a lot with people who would say, oh, well, who tells you what to write? And um, they'd send me stuff, and I'd kind of look it up. And invariably, I mean, the ones that I remember off the top of my head were Codex Elementarius. There was some kind of conspiracy theory that that was a corporate takeover of the food supply, and there was all these, these uh, different... Kind of corporate interests involved. There was something to do with the swine flu vaccine back in 2008, 2009, I think it was. And, and I looked into those and they, and there were sort of smoking guns or some kind of piece that I invariably found had been like taken out of context or misunderstood or deliberately misrepresented. And I, 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 I hit a dead end kind of nearly, nearly every time. Um, I, I'd exclude from that. I think a lot of a lot of the, I'm also skeptical of kind of a lot of other narratives like Kennedy assassination being the obvious one. 9-11, uh, I don't think was an inside job. I've, I've not met a single person, I can honestly say I've not met a single person who, a 9-11 conspiracy theorist, who has read The Looming Tower, which is the Pulitzer Prize winning account, primary sources of um, by Robert Wright, Lawrence Wright, sorry, who wrote the amazing book about um, Scientology going clear, which basically exploded Scientology. Like he's an amazing writer, an amazing thinker. And I'm not saying that he's def definitively right. I think it, it's, it's, it's a very persuasive book. I'm not saying it's definitively right, but I am saying it's very weird how all of these people that build a huge part of their identity around 9-11 are not seeking out, like they talk about, oh, how can you believe the official narrative? And hardly any of them even know what the official narrative is. 
that's been my experience. Um, and I know people get very exercised about that and as with other topics. Um, so, I, so the really interesting thing with QAnon now is where it goes. And there's a, there's a podcast called QAnon Anonymous that I listened to the other day where they say that QAnon, QAnon is so resilient that they wouldn't be surprised if they reorient to saying that Biden is also part of the plan. But there's many, there's many of them who will be kind of like, they're convinced that Trump will not be, will, will, Biden will not be inaugurated. Trump will, will kind of pull some rabbit out of the hat. And a lot of them will be kind of like bereft. But they think that, that the mentality is such that they'll include that Biden's actually one of the good guys. Biden's actually in on this and he's going to continue the, the storm is coming sometime in the future. I don't, I don't know. It's interesting. It's an interesting speculation. Um, another one uh was there's a, another really good article by nicholas grossman in arc digital saying that qanon has now attracted the attention of the real deep state like before they kind of talked about the deep state now they're really on the deep state's radar and they're about to find out what that really means nicholas is a is a professor of government at illinois university and he he goes through like what that's going to mean how that's going to change and that's it's it's perfect in a way because that's what happens with paranoia. Paranoia, the paranoid mindset creates the thing that it that it fears. Um, no, the, the deep state, the deep state, it's not a conspiracy, it's a good question, Ellie. And he he outlines what it is in this article in a in a quite the, the deep state in QAnon terminology, I say is a is a conspiracy theory, like what they think the deep state is, because it has too much agency. Like the deep state is a vast, sprawling bureaucracy that has some agency, but very little. It's sort of there's so many tensions. There's so much kind of inertia. There's so much. There's so much tensions between the different different parts of it. Like the you can drive a drive a uh, truck through the middle of it, which arguably happened with with 9/11. Like the, the FBI and the CIA were not working together at all. Like that's a, is an absolute scandal. Um, and but yeah, the, the the thing that I find with conspiracy theories more generally, and I am using the word quite broadly, but certainly the all-encompassing ones, and most of the conspiracy theories I've found is that they rely on seeing media and government as an undifferentiated thing. And that's not, that's not a judgment, because for most people it is. Like, I think unless you've actually, like, dealt with either of those on a, on a kind of up-close basis and seen how, how it's like cats in a sack with journalism, and with most of these things, these are fucking massive stories. If any of this stuff was true, this is a fucking massive story. Like it's not, the, what you realize if you know how, if you've seen government and, and journalism up, up close is what seems like a kind of relatively small conspiracy theory starts becoming bigger and bigger and bigger because you realize that the number of people that would have to be in on it, the, the epistemic closure that would have to be present, the, the enforcement that would have to be present for anything of that size to exist, starts becoming all encompassing. And I think that's part of what the why these are so psychoactive and how people can can find themselves going actually starting to kind of lose themselves because because the size of it starts to mushroom and you're like, I can't trust anything now. Like it may start with a small conspiracy, but when you when you keep following and you keep following that thing, you realize that for it to be true, all of this other stuff would have to be true as well. And also, as, as I think I've talked about before, it's you're, you're getting into archetypal realms here. You're getting into theological realms. You're getting into spaces where you're dealing with satanic imagery, like Bill Gates or uh, pedophile, like blood eating, pedo, blood sucking pedophiles, or Hillary Clinton, or literally as Lucifer. You are in archetypal realms. You are in psychoactive territory, which is which is another reason that this stuff is. Like one of the pieces of the PSYOP, like an account that talked about QAnon as a PSYOP also said that it's no accident that like child sacrifice and all of this really gruesome stuff is at the core of it because it puts us into a disassociated state. And I think that's why especially it has an impact on, on women, who are, especially women with children who can kind of visualize what that would mean. If you can actually visualize what that would mean, you are in a disassociated state. You are becoming programmable. You are becoming, you're losing your ground. That's an incredibly powerful set of images to play with. And it's, it also has a, 
a deep history as well. Like it's not far off what the the, the Nazis said about like Jews. They they drank the blood of they drank the blood of children as well. Like they, these have like in the, this is I'm talking about the uh, protocols of the elders of Zion and what the Nazis said about Jews. Like these were these were narratives that have incredible deep roots and are easily kind of re reamplified and go back to the Middle Ages. Like these were these were themes that came up in the Middle Ages. This is a kind of renewal of a medieval worldview in many ways. And it's a really, and it's why we're in this kind of irrational, why we're in this kind of deep uh, sense of, yeah, pre, pre-modern structures coming up. And the, as, as we've said many times, like we're gonna have to navigate this. We're gonna have to navigate this new, re- this new sort of return of the irrational. That's the territory that we're in. Um, and I mentioned before, the the Alex Jones banning, like I I can't disagree with that. I can't disagree. The kind of stuff that was being, like conspiracy theories like that that led to like Alex Jones. One of the conspiracy theories he put out was about the Sandy Hook school shooting where children were shot dead, putting out that that didn't really happen. Their par- the parents were crisis actors, which led to the parents getting death threats, the parents getting abuse. Like this is. These have consequences. These kind of these these narratives have real world consequences, and the real world consequences of what Trump has been doing and QAnon has been doing, they have real world consequences. We saw that in the in on Wednesday. We may see that in the run up to the inauguration. This is an incredibly difficult situation, and and the the terms of service of the like there's no terms of service about not lying on social media. There's no terms of service about not like they, they're not exhaustive enough. They're, these are not questions that I think can be easily resolved. Um, like the, the the other complicating factor with someone like Alex Jones and, and Infowars is I don't think he believes much of the stuff that he he says. And I think a lot of people who watch it don't actually believe it either. Like part of it is just watching for the entertainment value of it. Um, and and that's fine. But there's going to be let's say even 95% of the people watching Infowars are watching it for the entertainment value. That's still 5% of people who are watching it and taking it seriously. And who knows what those, those people will do. And I don't think Alex Jones believes half the stuff he's putting out. There's a really great account in a book by a journalist called John Ronson called Them, where he, he was there when Alex Jones and he uh, went to Bohemia Grove, which became a centerpiece of Alex Jones's mythology. So they basically went to this place where they said, um, so it's, it sounds a little bit like well, the way John Ronson described it. It sounds like a little bit of a kind of weird summer camp for um, the rich and famous. But in Alex Jones's telling of that story, he kind of embellished it and embellished it and embellished it. And then they saw child sacrifices in the forest. They saw uh, the Bush family. They saw all of these people. And John Ronson's like, I know you know that's not true, Alex. Why are you saying this? But But Alex Jones some time ago found that the, the bigger the, the story he could spin, the more attention he would get. And he like, how do you how do you regulate that kind of that kind of perspective? We know that the stickiest stories are often the most visceral and they're not the most truthful. The most truthful stories are not the stickiest ones. If you're prepared to see a world where there is literally no moderation, we know that any any message board degenerates with no moderation. Like everything becomes becomes 4chan with no moderation this is the this is the situation we're in in the public space and this kind of it it drives me crazy that so many people have such an a, a, an unnuanced view of what free speech has to mean like it's not that simple like i i think tristan harris said freedom of speech does not equal freedom of reach like you can like trump is Trump has booted, been booted off Twitter, but he sc- still has all of the world's press. He still has the White House uh, press room for now. I, I, I don't know. I don't know what any of the answers are. And I'm equally worried about the overreach on the other side. But, but I, I don't know what you do with these kind of extended narratives that that have such consequences. And I, if you open everything up. Do we just, uh, I mean, if you're a free speech absolutist and you say, 
I think uh, armed, like an increase in, in armed groups, I think an increase in, uh, in, in deaths, an increase in conflict is a price worth paying for everyone to have unlimited access to all social media channels at all times. Fair play, you've got a stronger stomach than I do. You might be right, you might be wrong, I don't know. But I, I, I don't see that there's any alternative to some kind of moderation, because I, I just don't think it works in the small scale, and I don't think it can work in the large scale. Um, so had a, I've got a couple more pieces. Just, just the one thing I wanted to say about the, the election is stolen narrative, because that was obviously the fuel of what happened on Wednesday we there's a brilliant article another article i'll send to you which is called why am i so angry by an old school conservative saying i've been shocked at what i've what i've seen i thought that trump throwing pence under the bus would be the jumping off point for all the social conservatives but it hasn't been um because his but he, he said we held our noses voted for trump because he chose pence we thought that pence would be a conservative that we trusted him um and the Republican Party is under Trump is no longer a conservative party. It's not conservative in any meaningful way when you're trying to tear everything down. Um, and he writes really beautifully about that. And I think we're now seeing, no one can stand up and say, look, we don't know that the, we know that the election definitely wasn't stolen. All we can say is it doesn't look like it from all of the, like all of the evidence that's been put forward. None of it has been stood up in court, despite the fact that there's a, there were, there were several recounts in Georgia under Republican uh, Republicans. What what you saw a lot with the with the lawyers was they would say all sorts of stuff in press conferences and not say any of it in court. Like the actual bills that they were putting forward, claiming election fraud, did not say the same as what they said in the press conferences because there are consequences of lying to courts. Like the the whole narrative unraveled, and and also when there was a bill that I think ten. I think it was the end, it was either six or eight senators who, who backed it in that in the Senate, and quite a lot of House Republicans backed it. But even that bill didn't have any, it said that the wording was something like people have skepticism about the election process and this is an unsustainable. It didn't, that there was no evidence in that either. Like the, the I, I've not seen any any trustworthy commentator claiming that there's anything to, that, that any of that, any of the elections being stolen narrative has been sustained, I would say. This, this for me is the, is, is the big lie, like it's a loyalty test. It becomes a loyalty test after a while. And the big lie becomes something that fragments, fragments culture and fragments society and has been, so uh, Andrew Sullivan, who we heard for before, has called Trump a tyrant and I, I've always been sort of skeptical of the hyperbole around this conversation, but I think, I think he's right in that he has a tyrant's um, psychology. And he looks at play, he talks about he looks at Plato. He uses examples from Greek literature to say a tyrant is someone who cannot control himself, so he tries to control everything outside himself. And I think Trump, we're, we're lucky that people haven't gone along with him. Like, if if America survived, it's because people refuse to go along with Trump enough people refused to do what he asked them to do and wanted them to do. And that's where we're at right now. And I think it, if it looks like it will survive, and obviously there are, I'm well aware there are big lies on the left, like we've, we've covered that in the past as well, like the left ignoring reality, all of those things certainly exist on the left, as, but it exists, it, it, it really does exist on the right. And I don't see, yeah, I, that, that for me is the clear and present danger, which is why I'm kind of pointing to it here in this, in this event. And it's also, and it's also true that the, the coverage of the, the, the riots in the summer was a, an absolute scandal by the mainstream media. It was, it showed the kind of capture of the media, which is something that uh, in the what is the, what the fuck is going on sense-making series, I kind of covered that as it was happening, like this, this, this takeover of the media by by woke culture. Andrew Sullivan leaving New York Magazine, um, Barry Weiss leaving the New York Times. All of those kind of revolts that happened at the, at the time, like all of that, is also is also true. But what I'm what I'm trying to 
articulate is we have to be able to chew gum and walk at the same time. The fact that one thing is true does not mean that we, that we can't acknowledge that other things are true as well. Uh, and that's been my, yeah, my, my, my frustration, I think, is that I've seen, I've seen the double standards um, over the last, yeah, over the last few days. We, we also, the sort of frameworks of the, the blue church and the red religion, which I think are a, a really useful heuristic, a really useful way to understand that Jordan Hall put into some of his first um, pieces and has sort of followed up since. Was this, so the idea being that the, the red religion, uh, the blue church is controlled by sort of the left. The red religion is the insurgency that, that is fighting back against that and is a sort of collective intelligence. And that's what won the 2016 election was this sort of nascent collective intelligence through meme warfare and through information warfare that took over, um, which I think is a really, really useful framework. It's a useful heuristic. But what happened on Wednesday was also the culmination of that collective intelligence. Like it wasn't centrally directed. It wasn't, it didn't need to be centrally directed. It was, it was enough for it to be for Trump and the, the QAnon in particular, but, but Trump to direct it in and to sort of say what was required in the same way that I saw this example. There's a, there's a famous, the, the Archbishop of Canterbury was killed in the 12th century, I think in the UK uh, after the, the monarch at the time, maybe it wasn't the 12th century, I'm, not, I'm gonna get that wrong, but it was, it, was in, it was in the medieval times because the monarch had said, will someone rid me of this troublesome priest in the earshot of some knights who then went and killed the Archbishop of Canterbury. And that's effectively, I think, what, what Trump was doing on, on Wednesday, which is why now we're seeing a lot of, we are starting to see Republicans distancing themselves from him. We are seeing some of them saying that they're gonna support the impeachment. And it, it is about time because I think they, a lot of them sacrificed themselves to him over the last few years and, and sacrificed the, I think the Republican party was, was the most hollow structure and it was easily taken over by someone like Trump. And obviously there's something more to that, to that story. There's something more to that kind of necessity of a pushback against, against the, the establishment. Like Trump is, it's obvious who Trump is, like the, nar the narcissist that he is, it's been obvious since the beginning. And I've seen some people kind of denying that. If you know anything about human nature or human, like he, he is what he is. He was, he was, I can't even say that he was the wrong person to win in 2016. Maybe he was the right person. I, like, I think, I think he was the necessary person to win in 2016. Like it was a necessary process, but that doesn't remove the fact that he is who he is and always has been. And I've seen a lot of people again, denying the evidence of their own eyes on that, that, that has, has shocked me a little bit. I'm just going to, yeah, just to, to round off that, I mean, the, the scary thing now, just coming back to the tech platforms, the scary thing now is that because nothing, there clearly needs to be some other kind of regulation rather than just the terms of service, rather than just relying on them to do the right thing, because they can't be trusted to do the right thing. They're subject to so many political pressures. It's, it's terrifying where, where we've ended up and it's probably too late for that moderation. What it looks like now is that we might end up with liberals and conservatives on separate platforms. Like we're seeing, we're seeing a much more fundamental epistemic split even than this kind of everyone in different Facebook groups and unbranding each other. And like we, we maybe will get to the point where we're just not even seeing what each other is saying. That's, that's terrifying and and again, to, to refer to, 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 to Jordan's perspective as well, which I think was really a brilliant insight, is that what we've done with social media is to weaponize temperament. That we've actually, because a lot of political belief is based on temperament, it's based on openness or, or conscientiousness. And, and we're only effective in groups of mixed temperament. That's why we have them. That's why we're so successful, is we, because we're, meant to be in tribes with different talents and different temperaments to solve problems. What we've actually done since the beginning of social media is weaponized and split off and polarized basically around temperament. We've weaponized temperament against each other 
And that is an existential threat. That is an existential threat to humanity. And it's only getting, it's only gonna get worse, I think, from here. Okay, I'll start with uh, Jessica Waite. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Okay, yes, thanks. Um, so my question as I wrote it was basically your take on how much of the epistemic fracture is based on like a deliberate propaganda campaign versus just basic bad human sense making. Um, but the heart of it is really more in some ways what to do about it. Um, and part, part of like in the sense making sessions yesterday, there was so much overwhelm expressed and I didn't say in my group, but I, I wished I had, you know, I think pandemic notwithstanding, we're overwhelmed because we're meant to be overwhelmed because <laughs> propaganda campaigns working. That's part of how it works. Our family units are fractured. We don't want to talk to people that disagree with us because it's all kind of working. And so, so just as individuals and then collectively as a group, like kind of how, mm -hmm. Yeah, how do we navigate that? Thank you. Yeah, it's a it's a good question. It's it's definitely both. I think that that um, I think a certain a certain necessity to educate ourselves on those techniques is really really key. Like that that book I recommended. This is not propaganda. Really, I'd highly recommend reading that because it's a it's a good expose of what. The, the bad actors are up to. And, and also this sense that it, it is basic, set, because we've never had to do it, like we could, most of us, the vast majority of us survived on going off what, what we saw in, in the media or on, um, like we, the Blue Church worked, if you, if you use that as a frame, the Blue Church worked for a long time and it's sort of ever growing kind of hollowing out and, and deconstruction means that we're having to do sense making ourselves in an, in an environment where we never had to before. Also, while we're being surrounded and overwhelmed by, by new sources of information that we, a lot of us don't have the ability to check. I mean, one of the other factors with QAnon that a lot of people have pointed out is that it's often older people who are more susceptible to it because they don't have it's 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 the digital natives are a lot a lot more able to to discern what's true and what's not and to to weight things differently. It's it's a lot. It's often like in the forum that I'm in. It's often parents. It's often grandparents that people are saying they saw one Q video and then they started. They went off down a rabbit hole. It's often the people who are not used to the internet that are being overwhelmed. So that's a a factor. And I, I will make one. One political point here, which is the, so Steve Bannon, who was Trump's kind of highly influential on Trump has got a phrase called flooding the zone with shit as a tactic for like, you don't, so that is a tactic that, that he introduced, which is you don't, rather than make one claim that then gets fact checked, you just overwhelm with, an, with, a, with a huge number of claims that cannot be fact-checked in time. You're just overwhelming the possibility of holding accountable by constant misinformation. That is a tactic that he perfected. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if he came up with it, it's been effective, that people on the other side will start to do it as well. I mean, it will likely be weaponized. He came up with it. I'm not saying that no one else in the political environment is doing that as well, because it clearly was very effective. Um, so thank you to whoever put the, the numbers there. That's very helpful. Oh, 11. Andrew Scott. <laughs> someone, someone put 27, except for delete by mods. Who's that? Uh, Andrew, are you, are you there? Oh, Andrew's not yeah. there. Ah. Yeah. I, I put two questions up. I was just looking at which one got voted. It's oh. the great reset one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, <laughs> funny you talk about the, the older folks because my mom doesn't usually weigh in on this, but I go home for Christmas and she starts bringing me stuff on this great reset, which I thought like initially was just going to be like a bogus conspiracy theory. But then I see it's proposed by the World Economic Forum and 
uh, like Prince Charles and stuff. And I'm like, what relationship does that have to conspiracy space and the different actors therein? And is it reasonable to assume that there's something deeper going on? It's just like kicked it down a whole new rabbit hole. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll preface it by saying I don't, I don't know a huge amount about it. I haven't, I haven't gone down that particular rabbit hole, but I'll, I'll explain why I haven't gone down it. I mean, I've been on the website, I've read, I've read what it says on the, w, on the World Economic Forum website. I've seen a few of the pieces that people were talking about. My, my initial hit on it, and I've been, I've been sort of in and around various uh, non-governmental organizations and, and um, yeah, different projects that are given names like that. And it's the not, but the World Economic Forum doesn't have the power. Like it's not, I think a lot of people who kind of dial into this sort of assume that it has like a vast amount of agency and can kind of uh, coordinate stuff. The World Economic Forum is not really like that. It's for me, what I, what I saw it as is, is a kind of recognition that things have changed massively with the coronavirus and how can we move it in a positive direction? It's, it's not to say that that in itself cannot be a dangerous thing because there's all sorts of projects that can be, that people think are moving the world in a positive direction and don't. Um, I don't, I mean, what, if it's sold as a kind of like, oh, there's this thing that they've already coordinated and they're going to bring into, into action, that just doesn't pass the smell test for me. But the, the bad actors could or corporate actors, because most of the, the problem with a lot of these NGOs is that they only can do things that, um, that get buy-in from big corporations or get buy-ins from government. So, so even if it starts with, with positive intentions, it can often become that the corporations will use it as a way to, to lock in certain things that they want. Um, so I think it's worth keeping an eye on. I don't it doesn't oh that that's great yeah if anyone's got any good references or things that they've they've seen that they think are good sean has just put something in from the intercept about the great reset that i'll, I'll read afterwards um yeah it, it 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 doesn't feel to me like that's one of the reasons i've not really looked into it too much is it just feels oversold as a as a conspiracy theory and i don't think that the world economic forum i don't think that's what it does um and Prince Charles, um, I quite like Prince Charles actually. He's a <laughs> he's been, he's been a, a, a wacky follower of he's he said some very unfashionable things for a very long time about like homeopathy and um, organics and like he's he's a very he's a he's a friend of Rupert Sheldrake's. He's a deep spiritual thinker. He's kind of considered very wacky, but he's not he's not. He's a, he's a very poor, for me, everything that he's done so far, he makes a very poor candidate for uh, kind of some kind of cabalistic takeover through a great reset thing. Yeah, I don't think that's the, the real danger, but the, like that it could be hijacked, right? And, and I think that yeah. the fear, fear of that is real and the fear of that is felt by everybody all up the tiers. Yeah, and I think that it's it's advisable to be clear on what it means and and evaluate those plans on their own merits. Um, but I but I I mean as, as an idea, like could we use the, the Corona crisis to help push forward to more sustainable ways of being? That sounds like a great idea. I'm suspicious of what that means. I'm suspicious of what that means in practice because any of these big big plans inevitably degenerate in what can you get the, the most people behind and that becomes what can you get the most corporate interest behind and they they start getting watered down so that yeah so i that's yeah. what i would say about it but, I, but as i say i've not i've not followed it i've not maybe, maybe it could be good to put something out on the channel about it because it has come up quite a few times people are interested in the topic i think the hubris is there but yeah go for it yeah um, so I think Josh Uri is, is next. Josh, are you there? 
Yeah, um, I'm a little surprised because it didn't get any upvotes until um, just now, I guess. Um, so the question is, and I was thinking about this yesterday and kind of visualizing it, but um, do you think it's possible that um, basically the, the fact that we're seeing these mythic, rational narratives like Black Lives Matter, wokeism, and QAnon coming through because there are real concerns that people have around the um, you know increasing inequality and the seeming lack of care, concern, and competence from leadership, our institutions, et cetera. And so these, these kind of narratives take hold and um, propagate because they're ways for people to tap into the thing that they have that these things are, you know, unfair and that the situation is getting worse and worse. And it gives them a kind of a, so the, the way that I put it in the actual written question is, it, it gives people kind of the mental and emotional toeholds to fight back against the sense of increasing inequality and um, the lack of care and competence from our institutions and the elites, et cetera. Mm. Yeah, that's a really good question. And also, I mean, I guess within that is the sense of how do you, how, how do you harness the mythic and the irrational in a positive way? And how do you guard against sort of capture on, on both sides? I mean, it's been a big, like, I, I follow, for example, if you're going to use sort of the Black Lives Matter or the wokeism topic, like I follow James Lindsay on Twitter. I think I've been a little bit critical of him in, on, in the past. Like, there's a danger if you start being aware that there is a possibility that that wokeism can be uh, weaponized, which it certainly can. I think any any ideology can be weaponized. That you end up throwing the baby out with the bathwater, and I see that happening a lot. Like James Lindsay is a perfect example of that. Like, a, there doesn't seem to be a lot of empathy or a lot of kind of uh, like anything that sort of that moves in the direction of diversity. He sees as like a, a hidden um, a Trojan horse for. Uh, a, a deep sort of equity plan that is then going to enslave, et cetera, et cetera, and which, which I think is very unhelpful. Like we have to be able to differentiate between valid um, expressions of something and the, and the toxic expression of it. Um, I'm not sure what the valid expression of, of, of QAnon is, but, but the question of, yeah, the question of how, like this, this, this is the central piece, I think. Like, how do you, how do we integrate the return of the religious, the return of the irrational, in a healthy way? Like that, I think is the, that's the sixty million dollar question of, of what occupies the space of religion, because politics should not occupy the space of religion, and that's part of, I think, the problem with, with how the Black Lives Matter narrative or the woke narrative gets out of control when it, when it starts occupying the space of religion. I had a really great, or identity becomes the prime, like we're more than our identity. And I think that's something, like while recognizing that different identities have a harder time for, because, because of um, their upbringings or because of no fault of their own, where they might have been born, what might have happened to them, like keeping that empathy, but also recognizing that that we are that that transcends as well as that and not it, it for me for me that's i guess if we're talking about black lives matter in particular we're sort of talking about the difference between the the view of someone like martin luther king who who held this kind of there's a destination there that's not a zero sum game like there's a lot of that narrative that becomes a zero sum game that suggests that for someone to succeed, someone else has to fail, or someone else has to, and then you, but but I, I don't believe that that's the case. I believe that that we can we can have more equality and equality of opportunity. But it but it's like there's a difference between the narrative that sees that sees beyond where we're at and one that, that only sees the sort of um the earthbound in a way. In the same way that, that commun I think communism is a perfect example. Like if you try and make your, this is what Jordan Peterson was talking about. If you're trying to make your utopia on earth and that, that descends into hell, it, it, you have to have an ideal beyond that. 
Um, and I think partly it's like, how do you emphasize, how do you, how do you find and emphasize and, and, and support the voices that have that perspective? Like that's what I've tried to do in, in some of the interviews with, um, and I'd like to find more, I'd like to find more people. I, I, I'm actually, I met this, has anyone here heard of Prince EA? He's a, he's quite a, he's got like 6 million followers on YouTube. So he's doing better than we are. Um, he, he's a, he does these amazing uh, spoken word pieces. Uh, he's actually hanging out in the place that I, like he left yesterday. Or I spoke to him yesterday and he, he has, he basically is, is living that he's basically, he's, he's deeply spiritual and is, he did a piece after the, the George Floyd murders, but it was, but it was all about, we need to, we need to look at what is beyond identity. So there are people doing that. There are popular figures who are doing that. And I think it's, it's about finding and, and amplifying those, those people. Does that answer the question, Josh? Yeah, I think so. Um, uh, the one thing that I would differ with that you were saying is that um, I don't think that, so you were looking for a reason why the, or you were looking for a positive way to turn the narrative to something that's that's not as, because you're, you're right, the wokeism thing and the QAnon, there, there's a lot of darkness there and it's a lot about tear things down. Um, do we have myths that are more generative that we can tap into? I think that's a good question. Um, I guess where I was coming from with my question was um, the idea that people are latching onto these these narratives because it gives it gives kind of a um, a voice or a it feels congruent with with how they're feeling about the way reality is. Um, but but I, I like I like the way you turn the question to can we tap into something that's more positive? So that's that's a question to consider for sure. Yeah, what just came up was also the war on sense making three with Jamie Wheel. I thought he articulated that story really well, and that's that's why it's so difficult and Dame, and it's why it's such a difficult perspective and why the reevaluating of Western, the attack on Western, on our history is such a dangerous thing because I think, like he said, can we accept, can we see all of it as heroic? Can we see even the failures and the reckonings with those failures of, of, of the American story as part of that story is, and it's all included. I really recommend listening to that. It's like, we have to, we have to re-embrace the heroic nature of our past. I don't, I think that is the heroic story. And there are, there is so much that is, that is valuable in that. And yeah, I think, I think even, even the, the failures of it and even the reckoning with it is, is part of that story. Um, yeah. And I think that's why the, the attack on it or the, the attack on it. So is so dangerous because I think it's actually, we're cutting ourselves off from, from our greatest source of, of, of inspiration and our ancestors and why we're here. Um, yeah. Cool, thank you. Um, so seven, Jeremy Beck. Hi. Um, my question was just about um, playing out the counterfactual with the election and the, the maybe the utility of that, because we have another election in two years with the midterms and four years for the presidency next time. What if Trump had won the electoral college, but not the popular vote? There was never really a chance of that happening. But if he had won the electoral college and Congress were meeting to certify that result, what would my side have done would it have been better or worse? And how would the media and social media companies have covered it and responded to it? It's a really good question. What do you think? Uh, at least the same and probably worse. Yeah. We, we, we burn things, that's our style. I think there would have been a lot more police on Capitol Hill for sure. Um, there's various reasons I've, I've heard why that didn't happen, part of which 
I listened to Jim Rutt's podcast today and he had a speculation and there's all sorts of kind of nefarious explanations that they were, I mean, certainly the National Guard were ordered to stand down, whether that was involved, that was to do with Trump or whether there were sympathies within the, the law enforcement. But one of the sort of more, um, the more, or, or the less sinister explanations is that they just didn't, they, they didn't think that that would happen because they're sympathetic. They thought they would be, they, they just didn't think that that was what that, that crowd was like. They're, they're sort of, they're, they're generally sympathetic to, to the Trump and, they, and, and they, they thought these were, but they just didn't see the danger with it, uh, which is possible. But we've also, I, I guess we've seen the pictures of the mass ranks of the National Guard when the Black Lives Matter process happened. Uh, there, there's a lot of that going around. Um, I think, I mean, you'd be seeing, you'd be, I don't think it would, you'd be seeing unrest. You'd be seeing basically what you saw in the, in the cities over the summer going on. And it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't just be happening in, in the, in the capital. That would, that's for sure. Like there would be, there would be a general sense that the, if the electoral college fail, if the electoral college is the only reason that, that um, Trump won, and lost the popular vote, I think the narrative would be on the left, that proves that the Electoral College was created by racists. It was, uh, it's, a her it's a handover from a, a past that is profoundly illegitimate because America's past is illegitimate. Therefore, America is illegitimate. Therefore, revolution is, is, is acceptable and necessary. I don't think, I mean, how far that would have gone and how professional the protest would have been, who knows, but we would have seen sort of a rolling, at least kind of mass disobedience for an awfully long time. Because that fits into the, I mean, that fits into the narrative of the, 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 the 1619 project of the New York Times. And that's why that, that particular project was so um, problematic, for want of a better word. Because not, not that it, like, it basically, if, if those people here don't know what it was, it was basically a project by the New York Times that reframed the origin of America, not uh, 1776, but back to the first arrival of American slaves on American soil in 1619, said that's the true founding of America. Now, to say that, that it, on one side, it's to have a project that sort of looks at the, the history of slavery in America is a positive thing, and, but to say that's the true founding of America, and then there was a lot of very dubious stuff in that about, it, it said that the, the Civil War was, I oh know the, the war of, yeah, the, the, the war of independence was about preserving slavery, which just doesn't fit. There was a lot of historians saying that doesn't, that just doesn't, doesn't fit, it doesn't make sense. Um, so it's, it's about whether America, whether America is a country with flaws that is struggling to live up to its image of itself or America is fundamentally an illegitimate project from the beginning. And that was what that was, was promoting. And that's why it was such a contentious thing. And for a long time, there was a lot. Now I think they, they've actually, the New York Times have actually had to recount, recant a lot of the, uh, a lot of the stuff that was in there. But the woman who put that together, um, uh, Nicole, Nicole, can't remember her name. Um, she actually, during the riots, someone tweeted, should we call these the 1619 riots? And she retweeted it and said, I would be honored. So like that, that's part of the sort of the decline of the media, the decline of the New York Times, why this has become such a kind of incredible, um, incredible battleground. And that's why it was such a, a battleground at the time. Um, so yeah, I think that would have fit into that same narrative of this is a fundamentally illegitimate country. Look at look at this this handover from slave owning times that's created this result. How dare they? Um, and that would have yeah, I think I think we would have seen massive civil unrest for probably the next four years or so. Um, but yeah, really good question. Uh, Ron Walker. Hey, thank you, David. 
Um, and, and thanks. It's it's I'm at least finding just listening to you extremely calming after listening to a lot of news. So I appreciate that. You probably get that a lot. Um, no, no, I've, I've never done something like this before. So <laughs> oh, okay, but the, your calming effect. Uh, and this kind of this question, I, I think you've already partially addressed it and alludes to a lot of things people have been asking. But when I've taken a deep dive into the news. I'm most struck by, the more I look into it, how much explicitly archetypical, archetypal and imagery and symbolism and religious stuff and esoteric stuff was amongst the uh, insurrectionists, both their narrative and in the physical stuff, dress, all that stuff. Uh, and I'm wondering, however you want to take this, what you make of that, because it's one thing when a mob descends into mayhem and maybe is breaking into stores and stealing TVs, but if you're animated by, I'm acting on behalf of these really larger esoteric forces and, and I'm, a, I'm a, you know, a vessel for God or however they might be putting it, that's really, it seems like you can't put that genie back in the bottle and it, it really strikes me as problematic and I'm wondering how you view all that. It's, it's, it's one of the most fascinating aspects of that whole situation. I've just put a, an article into the, into the chat that my, my friend Jules wrote about conspiracy, he's wrote, written about conspirituality a lot in the past and then looks at the QAnon shaman. And that's a big thread in the, the QAnon universe. Like a lot of people have talked about how uh, a lot of kind of spiritual people have been drifting into the QAnon world over the course of lockdown, partly because the whole anti-vax thing came together with different, different sort of parts of, the, of um, the conspiritual landscape or spirituality, sorry, conspiracy landscape came together with the, with the spiritual landscape. And that, like that there's a very, very strong uh, narrative about meme magic being involved in Trump's election in 2016, like the return of um, Extinction Rebellion in the UK used sigils, like their, their um, hourglass sigil was a Viking sigil for it was the letter D. I, I, think, I think it was sort of a moment, meant a moment of awakening. Like people are starting with the election of Trump. I spoke to, this will probably be in the piece that goes out tomorrow with Eric Davis and, um, and Gary Lackman, they, they've been paying close attention to occultists first became aware of, wow, what's going on with, with Pepe the Frog as a sigil, with meme magic to do with the sort of the, with Trump in 2015, 2016. So it's kind of not surprising that more people are, 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 are finding that like, these things do have power. Like the, the point of them is that you, they focus attention like a, a sigil or any kind of um, magical piece, any symbol, it's, it's about direct, magic is all about directing attention, focusing will, trying to, trying to impose your will on reality. And that's something that I think a lot of people in the wake of 2016 are realizing is, is a factor and is part of the, the kind of the return of the irrational that we're seeing um, taking over. So in, and in a way, given how much how much it's overlapped with with spirituality it makes sense that a lot of that would be seen in uh in on capitol hill does that answer your question ron yeah there, there's a lot of ways to go with that but it, it just it strikes me as so key to what's going on it's not your your father's right wing as as you could might say it's it's almost you know i, I know people have talked about the hippie alt-right and that kind of thing there's there's just all kinds of strange emerging in the world of archetypes and what's going on so it's just something i'm curious about yeah and the, and the other fascinating thing is that the 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 right a lot of people talked about the right becoming the left um oh in so many different ways that it, it was countercultural suddenly to be right wing in 2015, 2016. It was, you had sort of the Milo Yiannopoulos, the sort of punk of uh, the right borrowed the clothes of the left. Um, in, in many ways, suddenly it was the right arguing for free speech, not the left. The, 
the riots in Berkeley in the 60s were about free speech. That was the left. Suddenly it was the right who were arguing for free speech, the left arguing for censorship. And then the culmination in many ways was on Capitol Hill where it looked like, who are, who are the freaky deaky uh, folk nowadays? Which saw, like, this is, this looks like the hippies looked in, in the 60s. It's like, where did these people come from? Like, that's, the, the world is, the world is turned upside down suddenly. It's, uh, it's, a, it's astonishing. Um, Eric Davis made that comparison. He compared it to the anti-war marches in the 60s. Like you had, you had the anti-war marches where they came and they tried to levitate, levitate the Pentagon. They were doing sort of, they were all coming together and trying to do like mind control on, uh, on the White House. Like these things were happening in, in the 60s. And now we've got that stuff coming. It's, if, if you can sort of step back from, from, from the terrifying uh, meltdown of reality in front of you, there, there's, there's a lot to, to be kind of entertained by, inspired by. There was a beautiful line at the beginning, I'll, I'll find it, uh, that, that Eric Davis put together, um, the piece that he brought out, I'll, I'll read it. And I'll put it into the chat as well. Eric's a fantastic writer. At what point did you start to feel that reality was melting down, or at least not at all what it used to be? If you're still managing to cling to the idea that the contemporary world is comprehensible, and that a historical event remain distinguishable from bizarre and fabulous imaginings, you now have to face the spectacle of the Q shaman howling to his heathen transdimensional gods in the Senate chambers of our benighted republic. It's, yeah. It, it's it's an amazing it's amazing time to be alive. <laughs> um, I feel like that. I'd, I'd like to end on that. I was going to take one more question, but but that feels like a good a good point to end on. Um, and I yeah, I want to really thank everyone. Really great questions, and just for having yeah, feeling like I yeah had had a little bit of the freedom to to kind of. As, as Jordan Peterson often says, we don't necessarily know what we think until we express ourselves. But there's something really important about being able to express ourselves, to know what we think and to develop what we think. And that underpins a lot of the work that we're doing here. That's why we create the breakout rooms in the, in the live sense making. It's to kind of to get to that point of feeling able to express ourselves and to, to learn what we think. And I, I felt very uneasy about doing this and putting it out on the channel. Like I, I know how fucking horrible the YouTube comment thread can be and I'm probably a little bit too thin skinned on that. And, and I, I thought, I know I'll, 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 and I wanna thank you for providing that safe space to, to kind of, to feel that I'm able to express myself and to learn a little bit more about what I think. So um, I really appreciate that and look forward to seeing everyone again soon for for more. Our ability to make sense of the world is breaking down. We're making more and more consequential choices with worse and worse sense-making to inform those choices, which is kind of running increasingly fast through the woods, increasingly blind. Over the last two years, Rebel Wisdom has interviewed some of the world's top thinkers. Now we've brought them together for an eight-week online course, Sense-Making 101 with Daniel Schmachtenberger, Diane Musho hamilton John Viveki, Doshin Roshi, and more. Improve your sense-making, develop your sovereignty, and join a wider community looking to do the same. <laughs>